Now, horticulture produce has doubled in export value over the past decade to $6.2 billion, fast becoming a rock star of the primary sector, chasing sheep and beef at $9 billion. Now, how are threats to this booming sector with the implications of COVID-19 lockdowns both here currently in Auckland markets and continuing to affect our markets around the world? Uh, joining us now to discuss a multitude of different topics that explode across the horticultural sector is Richard Rennie from Global HQ. Good evening, Richard. Now, could you um, give us a bit of an update? Uh, firstly, hot off the press, uh, Zespri's results, another record. Yeah, um, the records seem to keep tumbling at Zespri, don't they? I see they just out this afternoon with a uh, turnover, uh, total turnover figure up 7% to $3.3 billion on last year. Uh, and a profit increase of around about 10% to $200 million. Um, if you're a grower, what does that mean? Uh, if you're a green grower, you're going to average a $67,000 a hectare return, and if you're a, a lucky gold grower, it's another 100000 on top of that at about $165,000 a hectare. So, yeah, some big dollars in there. You do pay to get access to that gold fruit, of course, but um, the returns are certainly coming back to the growers, yeah. And whereabouts are we seeing that biggest growth? Is it particularly China? Uh, it is China, Sarah, but not, not only. Um, the top three markets are uh, now China, Japan, and interestingly, Spain. Uh, the Spanish have gone nuts for Zespri kiwi fruit in the last three years, um, particularly on the back of uh, COVID with a view of it being a fruit that's high in vitamin C, it's good for you, it's got its own skin wrapped around it, so it's safe to eat once you peel it. Uh, and yeah, it's now, those are the three, um, th top three markets, but um, also being chased quite strongly with growth in the USA and also South Korea since the tariffs were lifted about five years ago, um, growth there now has been increasing year on year as well, yeah. And particularly the other favourite is of course our avocados, uh, how are they sort of faring and, and the wider vegetable uh, produce range? Uh, yeah, it seems that um, avocados are sort of almost like the, if, there's, if, if Zespri's the poster, the poster then um, it may be avocados are the postcard. They're certainly not far behind avocado, uh, kiwi fruit in terms of the level of uh, growth they've been experiencing, massive expansions in the Northland region. Uh, and with it, um, this, this is the second year just coming up, I think, yeah, second year for getting access into the China market. Um, it was a bit of a, a first for, for New Zealand to get in there. Uh, the fruit there that I saw there last year was uh, on the shelf for the first time, viewed as more expensive, but also a higher quality fruit than would have been offered up till, up till then. Uh, and interestingly, efforts to try and get into the Indian market as well, which is, uh, I mean, yeah, quite big for almost any New Zealand food company. Uh, and a lot of opportunity being seen there as well. Yeah. In Farmers Weekly this week, uh, Neil Wallace covered off around the um, challenges affecting the fresh produce, and particularly with air freight costs rising really high. Um, are we sort of at threat to this great growth from the effects of COVID globally? Yeah, the, the government did put in a, uh, quite quickly too, back in March, put in a program to to maintain air freight uh, around about a hundred thousand tons a year of, of produce is freighted um, on, on via air freight which is a surprisingly larger amount than I might have thought um, a lot of it comes back to your higher value um, uh, products particularly cherries are a big one the air freighted to the likes of Taiwan and South Korea over season and uh, there are questions this year about how that's going to go. Um, so far, it seems the link's been maintained, but we are at sort of a bit of a low point of, of, of season. Obviously, we're not harvesting cherries yet. But um, I think we seem to have done pretty well up till now. And I, I just from people spoken to, I don't get a sense that there's too much panic there about it. We seem to be able to, we seem to be getting good at negotiating, navigating our way around these obstacles as they present themselves. So, yeah, cautiously optimistic, I think, would be a good description. Nimble Kiwis that we are. Now, of course, here at home, we're experiencing level three lockdown in our Auckland market for fruit and vegetables, and particularly the Pukakoi being right on that boundary. And you're ringing around today. How are they getting on with these uh, border? closures? Yeah, it seems last in the first national lockdown, the big issue was 
a lot of produce growers suddenly lost their markets overnight, whether it was restaurants and cafes not buying, you know, lettuces for paninis or whatever. Um, and there was a, a level of waste, so a fair bit did go to charity as well. This time around, the, the, uh, just, just talking to the president of the Pukato Veggie Growers today, she, she seemed to feel the bigger problem is this really unusual situation, which you're going to get when you start splitting the country into regions where Waikato is on one side of the road and literally Auckland's on the other. And if you're a produce grower, it's quite likely you're going to have a foot in both regions. But that's making business very difficult for those growers up there um, to the point where um, one grower said, look, if I get a, a puncture on my tractor on the Waikato side of my operation, I have to go south, to, you know, 100 k south to get someone to come and fix it because I can't get someone to come from Auckland almost literally across the road. So, or it will take a long time to negotiate access for them to come and do it. So yeah, there's some really funny little ish, operational issues coming up there. Well, not a little, they, you know, tr truck drivers, most of your produce warehouses are sitting on the Auckland side of the um, region, but the growing area is in the Waikato side and trucks having to try and cross between regions is quite problematic when you've got to go through checkpoints to do it. Yeah, so that's, that's proven to be a big one for them, yeah. So, of course, hopefully this will be the end of Level 3, fingers crossed, and that um, it should be around by next Friday. What about the flow-on effect, though, that we are experiencing in multitude parts of the industry, which is labour? Um, of course, we yeah. come on the other side of harvest now, but what is it looking like going into the spring and summer so far? Yeah, labour's a really funny one. Um, I mean, we've still got estimates are we've still got about 8,000 of the 12,500 RSE workers still in New Zealand. A large number of them have been repatriated back to the Pacific Islands on special flights. A number of them are choosing to stay in New Zealand because they've got one eye on the view that um, they wouldn't be able to stay and continue to work if possible. Um, meantime, uh, at the same time, for next season, the industry is expecting to get 16,500 RSE workers. So there's quite a gap there that nobody really knows whether we're going to be able to fill. I would say, if try to be optimistic on other things, but I think it's going to be a big ask to try and get that number of workers back into New Zealand for the sort of summer harvest season. Um, maybe the upside, well, it's sort of trying to look for the silver lining, is maybe the Kiwis that get displaced, perhaps there will be a pool of labour there locally that can do the job that RSD workers would do. But keeping in mind that a lot of those workers are really quite skilled. Um, they've coming, been coming back regularly for a number of years and they're going to be hard to replace, even if we do replace them with Kiwis, uh, given the level of skill that they're going to be, uh, we're going to be missing in their absence, yeah. Mm. So so a, a game of two halves, one celebration, yeah. record exports, but the headwinds are still very real, Richard. Yeah, very much. And the labour market particularly is in a real state of flux where um, you know, the government has made a number of um, uh, concessions to the industry, so that visas run longer. Um, it's uh, for backpackers and holiday workers as well. And there's a petition out for them, uh, being put out by them to run it even longer if possible. Uh, but yeah, it's sort of going to be wait and see till um, probably October, November, post election, I'd say. Yeah, very much. Oh, thank you so much, Richard. Really appreciate you taking Hi. the time to join us tonight on Sarah's Country. Richard Rennie is Hi. one of the many very experienced agri journalists that are a part of the fold at Farmers Weekly and, of course, the larger Global HQ team. This is Sarah's Country.